Welcome, everybody. It is great to have you with us here this morning for the first Environmental Justice in Pennsylvania Symposium. My name is Peter Buck. I'm one of the co-chairs of this event today with my awesome partner, Rafika Mohammed. Rafika? Good morning, Peter, and welcome everyone to uh, this exciting event. As Peter has mentioned, this is our first um, EJ Symposium. We're very excited to uh, be in front of all of you and very honored uh, to be in front of all of you. Um, I just wanna share a little bit of information about myself um, on behalf of the um, committee. This is the state, the first statewide symposium, as we had mentioned, on environmental justice. And um, I'm also a recipient uh, recently of the Myra Lord Dot Partnership Diversity Award. And I also am a, co um, a founder of my own business called Sustainable Human Environment, um, located here in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. What we would like to start off this morning is that um, we want to definitely talk about some concerns that has um, arisen as we put our symposium together. And that's one of the reasons why we did this. We want to make sure that we cover and include um, issues that's dealing with environmental injustice in Pennsylvania. So some of the uh, concerns we would like to go over today before we get really into our, our program um, is uh, some concerns of some of our sponsors uh, that are supporting this uh, event. Um, one thing that I would like to mention, um, I am from Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. Um, the city of Harrisburg has been a uh, excellent supporter of this event. And also we have been in trouble with our incinerator. We had a terrible debacle several years ago that threw our city not into bankruptcy, but into type of a receivership. Um, it's been difficult um, being a resident here, um, putting up with selling our assets, um, dealing with um, increased taxes, et cetera, and just trying to move forward to live a decent life in the city of Harrisburg. Um, with that being said, the dollars that came from the city of Harrisburg um, came from our debacle with the incinerator. Um, there's uh, funding that comes back to the city of Harrisburg, which had established an environmental council, which I currently serve on about six or seven years ago. Those dollars are used to help the citizens of Harrisburg repair a lot of the environmental damage that has been caused by the incinerator, um, as far as trash, making sure we have better collection, making sure that um, we educate our community. And I wanna stop right there. I wanna talk a little bit about us and being educated in our regions and in our communities and in our local, uh, municipalities. A lot of this starts with us as individuals um, as far as the environment is concerned. Um, with us, as far as I'm saying, like if we don't take time and clean up our areas and sweep up our areas and putting trash into proper receptacles and those things that we all do, just throw stuff out in the street. A lot of that is us. Um, what we can do and what we uh, are doing is what we did was create hubs in our regions. We looked at our regions across the state. We see we have six. Um, we said, let's start there. Let's make these hubs a central place where residents can come, students can come, clergy and other religious organizations can come universities and et cetera, that can come and get resources that can come and have safe places where they can talk about um, their health issues or what might have been packed through um, environmental injustice. Um, we wanna make sure that everyone is, in, is included. I, I'm new to some of this, as far as the policies and learning, it's been, um, very interesting learning curve for me just to find out what all across my state and what people are really dealing with. I had no idea how deep the fracking situation is. I had no idea as far as the mining situation is. And it does impact the people of Harrisburg. Anything upriver is going to come down and impact us. And um, so there, there's, there's a lot that we need to learn. None of us are too old to learn anything. But I do feel through this whole conference, um, that we put together, we have to look at ourselves as individuals. We have to look at ourselves as human beings on this planet. Um, a lot of this trash and stuff just didn't get here from Mother Earth herself. 
we put it here. So if we don't do anything today, uh, but hopefully, I'm hoping that people will walk away from this symposium, taking a good hard look and looking at our landscape with different eyes and looking and seeing what we can do as individuals, as residents in our community to improve environmental justice. Get more involved in your community. Um, we just feel that we want to uh, address the concerns that no one was being excluded at all at planning this. This has been very open. Um, we've been putting it out there for a while. And I'm being real honest, none of us are perfect. Um, but it's, again, it has to fall back with us taking those action steps and saying how I am going to get involved in my community. Peter, do you want to add on to that at all? Yeah, I mean, we're just, we're excited today to explore environmental justice in Pennsylvania and really learn what we can do together. We want to develop a network of champions and, and we know that there are champions in so many communities around the Commonwealth already. Uh, we know that black and brown, poor or middle class, whether you farm in a field, whether you live next to a factory, you could be a high school student or a high school dropout, you might have a GED or a PhD, we need everybody here. And so we recognize that we, the people, that you and your community have common cause to ensure that all people are equally protected, are meaningfully involved, and receive the benefits of a thriving environment. And one of the things that I think is so cool about Pennsylvania is that we are the only state in the United States with a constitutional amendment under Article 1, Section 27 that promises you the right to clean air, clean water, and the benefits of the natural environment for all the people. So that's part of why we're here today. And so, I'm the president-elect of the Pennsylvania Environmental Resource Consortium. We're a coalition of higher education organizations who knows that whatever we do, education, whether it's in the classroom or in your community, is absolutely essential to raising consciousness and to dealing with the power structures that make this happen. At the end of the day, this is fundamentally about the distribution of power and how you are treated in your home community too often by people who want to pretend that all, all this should be placed in somebody else's backyard. It's not just not in my backyard, it's placed in somebody else's. And too often, as Dr. Robert Bullard would say, it's placed in black backyards. And so we want to recognize the communities that have done so much work, whether you're in, you know, Shimokin whether you're in you know, Chester, uh, whether you're in North Braddock, PA, whether you're in Erie, no matter where you live, you have been, you know, you have been affected where you are, right? And so our hubs are envisioned as places where you can meet. But what we wanna do this morning really is get that common language and recognize that, that we do have common purpose. And so what we'll, be getting into here is we do have some people who we want to thank for being a part of this. And then we're going to be hearing from some, some uh, elected and appointed officials as well. Um, Rafika, would you, would you mind thanking the members of our planning committee? You're muted. I'm sorry, I was muted. Yes, uh, thank you. I definitely would. But one thing I do want to share with, uh, with the group is that uh, there were some questions about the funding, and I would do want to just to shine a little bit of light on that. Uh, the funding came to help put this symposium together. No hubs are getting paid to operate as, as uh, individual entities. Uh, none of these supports or sponsors are doing any of that. Matter of fact, when this day is over, we probably will need to look at how we can raise funds for our hubs, for them to operate, for them to function, et cetera. And we're going to need your help in that. That's why it's so critical to be engaged in a hub or create a hub. Um, we just want to make sure that we all have a safe place and clean place to live. I don't even want to talk about work and play. I'm talking about the live. So that's definitely, I just wanted to put that out there um, so people can understand where the dollars came from and where the dollars um, are going. 
So I do want to take a moment to thank our EJ and PA planning committee, and they include Allison Acevedo, Office of Environmental Justice, Justin Dula, Office of Environmental Justice, our EJAB board, Environmental Justice Advisory Board, uh, myself, Rafika Muhammad, Allison Robinson, Heather Beatty, Arthur Frank, and Adam Cutler. Our PERC uh, support is Shauna Bonhart, Peter Buck, Brianna Peterson, Ben Culberson, and Josh Hooper. Harrisburg University, Sarah McDonald, Lauren Holbuck, I'm sorry if I pronounced that wrong, Rebecca Smith, Jason Allison, Ivan, help me with his last name, Peter. Robert Kumar. Robert Kumar, thank you. Also, we want to talk, uh, uh, thank you very much. We couldn't really pull all this together without this person here, Howard Tucker. He's a blessing. Thank you for pulling all this together for us. And we really, really appreciate all the work you have done uh, supporting us and pulling us together. Next, we also want to uh, thank uh, PA Commonwealth, Eleanor Kinley, Allison Acevedo, Justin Dula, Kavantra, Kim Bradford, and Kavantra will talk a little bit more today about their uh, their roles and how they would like to, again, improve environmental justice. We have student volunteers from Harrisburg University. My God, these our students have did an awesome job, um, not just at the university, but with our, our hubs. Um, just wanted to share that our, our children, I don't mean to call them children in that way, but our children have played a significant part in pulling this symposium together. And that's uh, Marie Jean, uh, Jean Marie and Christina Cherry. Back to you, Peter. Great, thank you. And and really, we also want to thank all of you for all of the volunteer work that you do. Volunteers, you know, so, so many of you volunteer in your community. You don't have millions of dollars. You don't have armies of lawyers to, you know, go, you know, hijack whatever local government operation there is. You just have you, your love of your community, um, the heart that you have for your family and your neighbors, um, and and that's the most important thing. We do have to thank our sponsors, uh, the City of Harrisburg through the Harrisburg Environmental Advisory Committee that Rafika spoke of. We've also been sponsored by Covanta, by Drexel University, the Forbes Fund, PICO, and Penn Future. And in addition, Fox Rothschild and Penn State University's Vice Chair for the Humanities. Thank you for making this possible. Now, in just a few minutes, we'll be taking what we call a resource break. The Environmental Justice and Pennsylvania Planning Committee invited policymakers and sponsors to share their thoughts, their vision, and their commitment to environmental justice efforts. We consider these elected officials, companies, and organizations as resources and supporters to furthering our conversations, our collaborations, and actions. That doesn't mean that they're perfect, but it does mean that they're willing to help. On our first resource break, we will hear from our elected officials and policymakers. And on our second resource break, we will hear from one of our sponsors who supported our event in the memory of one of their employees, John Waffenschmidt. There are additional videos on a variety of topics that attendees can explore on their own over lunch in advance of the EJ Community Hub discussions this afternoon or after the event. So uh, we're going to hear now on video from Mayor Poppenfuse from the city of Harrisburg, from Councilman Majors, a brief message from Representative Kim, from Department of Environmental Protection, Secretary McDonnell, and finally, from Representative Bullock on behalf of the Pennsylvania Legislative Black Caucus. Take it away.
reduction in the total municipal electricity use by 39% and allowed us to convert
Well, thank you so much for that, for those words. Uh, Rafika, would you care to begin our introduction of Mustafa Santiago Ali? Yes, thank you, Peter. And welcome back, everyone. And thank you for those speakers and uh, the presentations that um, that they presented. I, I think that was just awesome. Um, again, I would definitely encourage everyone in this symposium to reach out to your elected officials. Um, if they're not doing what you need them to do, you know what to do. Um, it, it's, it's not hard, um, but I would definitely encourage all of us to look at how we can all uh, work together with our uh, local and elected officials. So what we would like to do is um, we want to give a round of applause for those people. Thank you so much. And it was a pleasure uh, to listening to them. Now I'd like to welcome Dr. Mustafa Santiago Ali. As we considered who we would bring to this event and help us to understand environmental justice more deeply and motivate us to action and consciousness, Dr. Ali was on our minds. So it is truly an incredible honor for both of us and our whole team to welcome him to this symposium. Peter, you're muted. All right. Thank you, Sister Muhammad. Can everybody hear me? Mr. Ali, that I'm sorry, I was muted. I wanted to say in, in your resignation letter to former EPA administrator, Scott Pruitt, and it does hurt my soul a little bit to say those words. Uh, you wrote, I have learned a few things I would like to share with you. And the first is communities speak for themselves. And this simple but profound truth is really why we have gathered here today so that we can listen and learn from one another in pursuit of environmental justice to help us listen better. And that's why we've asked you to come Rafika is going to say just a little bit more about you because, you know, there's there's an awful lot we can say. <laughs> oh, now you're muted, Rafika. It wouldn't be a day on a computer if we weren't all. I muted. know, I know. And, and I apologize to everyone. This is new for me. Uh, so please bear with me. <laughs> uh, my nervous part is over, so I'm getting a little bit of the flow of this. But um, Dr. Ali is a renowned thought leader, um, international speaker, policymaker, community liaison, trainer, facilitator, and the list goes on and on. Dr. Ali wears many hats. He's Vice President of Environmental Justice, Climate, and Community Revitalization for the National Wildlife Federation, NWF. The founder and CEO of Revitalization Strategies, the former Senior Vice President of Hip Hop Caucus, heading up their climate heading up their climate, environmental justice, and community revitalization efforts. Over two dozen years at the EPA, where he served under Republican and Democrat, Democratic administrations, until a few years ago, Dr. Ali is frequent contributor to our civic life. So without further ado, let's bring on Dr. Ali. Thank you, Sister Muhammad. I appreciate you so much. Uh, thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you for those kind words. Uh, thank you uh, for allowing me to share space with everyone for a few moments. Uh, thank you to the Environmental Justice Advisory Board. Uh, thank you to the Pennsylvania Environmental Resource Consortium. Uh, but thank you also to some folks who often don't receive uh, the accolades for all the work that they do. Each and every one of you who are watching, but also to Zeline Mayfield, to Mike Ewald, to Lynn Robinson, uh, to Carol Hoderman, uh, Bishop Dwayne Royster, uh, Caleb uh, Hedinger, Marta Gutenberg, uh, again to Sister Rafika Muhammad, uh, to Fred Brown, and to Jerome Shabazz, and thousands and thousands of other folks across the state of Pennsylvania are doing everything that they can to help our most vulnerable communities move from surviving to thriving to make sure that the voices of the unseen and unheard is no longer a paradigm that we operate from. I would be remiss if I did not also give honor and thanks to my indigenous brothers and sisters who land that I currently reside on, the Mattapanai and the Pamunkey and other nations and tribes 
um, who are the original inhabitants of our country uh, and who have also uh, shown us the way to actually live in harmony with the environment, even though we don't pay attention to it. The first principle of the environmental justice movement is about honoring Mother Earth. Imagine how differently um, our country would be if we actually lived up to that principle. Imagine our business practices, how differently they would look. Imagine our interactions with workers. If we actually honored Mother Earth, then that means that we would also be honoring uh, individuals and of course the workers who are often disproportionately impacted from pollution, from the impacts of climate change, uh, from <laughs> the COVID-19 pandemic, which was referenced earlier. And, you know, the second principle of the environmental justice movement um, brings us to a part of the conversation I want to have with you today around policy, making sure that policy is just, making sure that policy is filled with mutual respect, something that we're raised with, but we lose somewhere along the line for some folks. So I want to talk a little bit about policy. I want to talk a little bit about some of the impacts that are going on. We had such a fantastic presentation uh, in those short video clips, really highlighting some of the some of the things that are going on uh, across the state of Pennsylvania, um, but also some of the movements in a direction to make real change happen. And then I want to talk about this transformational moment that we find ourselves in, where we finally, after all the time that I've been doing this work, and many of you. Uh, some of you know me. Uh, for others, we are beginning to build family together. You know, I've been doing this work, uh, social justice work, since I was 16, and I've been working on environmental justice issues uh, for, oh my goodness, it's getting a long time now, over 25 years. And in this moment, you know, for once, we finally are able to connect the resources that are coming with these incredible sets of visions and actions to deal with many of these historic and in the moment impacts that continue to happen in communities. If we're going to have a real conversation and begin to deconstruct how we find ourselves in this moment with many of the challenges that we have currently going on, we have to talk about the historical actions around policy. Now, many folks who are watching, whether as advocates or activists, for those who've worked in local, county, state, or federal governments, uh, those in the philanthropic world, those even in academia, and inside of businesses and corporations understand that policy plays a role in the direction that an entity will go. The really interesting thing about policy is that policy can be transformative. Policy can uplift people. Policy can help to address past injustices if it is, or, um, if it is correctly put together. And of course, the voices of communities have to play a significant role in that. But we also know that policy can be destructive, can be dehumanizing, can do a number of very negative things. If we look at our indigenous brothers and sisters, we know that it was policy that justified them being taken away from their traditional lands, taken away from their traditional foods, um, was used to try and strip culture from them. And and I think about this in this COVID-19 moment, as we're dealing with this pandemic. Policy also, if you are a student of history, you'll understand how folks also exposed indigenous brothers to very dangerous diseases that they didn't have, uh, you know, the, the ability to fight back uh, against, smallpox, a number of other things. Policy justified taking Africans and bringing them to this country and enslaving them for free labor because of their expertise, stripping away their language, their culture, their foods, giving them the most dangerous jobs to do. With our Asian and Pacific Islander brothers and sisters, we see a similar dynamic a little bit further down throughout history where policy was used to bring them to help to build the infrastructure in our country, an important set of conversations that we're having in this moment where they helped to build our railroads and other parts of infrastructure. And then we put the Chinese Exclusion Act in place and said, hold up, that's enough of these uh, folks coming into our country. Policy said that women shouldn't have the right to vote. Policy said that women shouldn't have the right to own land. Then we began to fast forward throughout history. 
And we see that when we build authentic collaborative partnerships, how we can also use policy to begin to unpack some of these injustices that we've seen. We've seen that through the women's suffrage movement, how power can be built by bringing folks together, by educating folks, and beginning to dismantle antiquated policy, policy that is ineffective, policy that is a drag on our economy, policy that embraces uh, racism and sexism um, and, and inhumane sets of actions. And women slowly began to get the rights. And we know that there's still work to do in that space. Policy began to evolve through the civil rights movement addressing some of the Jim Crowism that we still see the ripples even today with some of the actions that have gone on in some states across our union, uh, trying to limit folks' ability to be able to vote. But we know during the civil rights movement, folks were fighting for basic amenities, basic rights. Voting was one of them, but just having access and being recognized as a human being. And we have a number of civil rights laws that came into being. Policy also played in a critical role in helping us to begin to get some of the basic environmental laws in place so that we would have a safety net across our country. When we look at the Clean Air Act, when we look at the Clean Water Act, when we look at RICRA and Superfund uh, and all of our Right to Know Acts and a number of others that are a part of that, we began to see how policy could be used to protect folks, but we know and because of a number of factors that those policies did not protect everyone. That's on the governmental side. Let me dig up just a little bit deeper uh, before I transition here to another point. Policies inside of our state governments, county governments, local governments, policies inside of our institutions also is critically important. When we look at the early environmental movement, it was not just injustices that were happening from folks in the governmental space, but it was also happening from organizations, big organizations, powerful organizations with leverage and access. Organizations like conservation organizations and environmental organizations, and I could go down the list, who were not focused on the impacts that were happening inside the communities. They were focused on, in many instances, protecting the status quo for wealthy white men. If you go back through history, you'll see that. When we look at lots of our early and important work, but yet still biased um, and not 21st century work, you'll find that, you know, when we were protecting lands and we're doing all this stuff, it wasn't for the betterment of everyone. It was for a particular group of folks. But there was some positive steps still that were beginning to take root. But in the environmental justice context, folks had to create their own organizations because folks were more concerned with wildlife, which is important. And communities of color, of course, cared about that also. But they were saying, well, wait a minute, what about us? What about us? Are polar bears more important than the lives of folks who you see every day? Are Trees, which are important, and we understand how critically important they are in our fight against the climate crisis. Are they more important than the lives of Mrs. Johnson? Are they more important than the lives of a number of other folks whose names we could call out their last names? So the environmental justice movement came into being because they said if nobody else is going to include us in the process, if nobody else is going to honor us, both in the resources that are needed, um, and uh, helping to frame out a new direction, then we will create our own organizations and our own movement. And for those of you who are history uh, of the EJ movement, you know what happened in 1991 with the first People of Color Summit, and even before then, uh, in 87, with the uh, landmark uh, studies that came out of that, and then even going back a little bit further to Warren County, North Carolina, and all of the incredible work that those brothers and sisters did to try and stop those trucks from coming in, bringing those PCBs. And again, it was policy in the state of North Carolina at that time that said that their community was a community where this very dangerous carcinogenic 
uh, sets of waste should go, even though there were seven other locations that were better suited for it, they chose that poor African-American community. Why is this history important? This history is important because, and earlier, some folks shared just a couple of quick things with you around redlining, zoning, and in certain parts of the country, restrictive covenances of creating sacrifice zones where we place everything that nobody else wants in those communities that it was assumed that they had less power, they had less access, they had less desirability from, for some folks that these are the people who deserve these types of things. And of course, there was less access for a long time to the vote and being able to actually frame out um, and push for what folks needed inside of their communities. And that's really important that we understand those historical contexts. Sometimes people will say, well, Mustafa, when we're talking about environmental injustices, who are we talking about? But we're talking about African-American communities. We're talking about Latinx communities. We're talking about Asian and Pacific Islander communities. We're talking about indigenous brothers and sisters. We're talking about lower wealth white communities. And as time goes by, there will be an evolution of others who are part of that. We're talking about those who are disproportionately impacted. And sometimes we get that twisted. And when we allow these silos to be put in place by whomever, and you can go back through history and understand the dynamics of why and how many of these uh, walls between um, communities, between different groups are put, because people understand if I can pit this one against that one, then I can continue with my behavior because they understand that when people come together, they become incredibly strong they become incredibly educated. They become an incredible force for pushing for real change to actually happen. And when we look at where we currently find ourselves in this country, the wealthiest country on the planet, we still have every year, and the numbers vary a little bit, and they went up over the last four years, we have 100,000 people who are dying prematurely from air pollution every year in our country. I want you to think about that. Living in the wealthiest country in the world and we still have over 100,000 people who die prematurely from air pollution. That's more people dying from air pollution than are dying from gun violence. And we all know how incredibly important that issue is. We turn on the TV and we still see people losing their lives every day from gun violence, but more people are dying from air pollution. But yet we don't hear that when we turn on our local news but the folks in communities where they have coal-fired power plants, where they have incinerators, where they have petrochemical facilities, a number of other uh, sort of polluting facilities in that space, they know how serious this moment is. And we also have to make sure that our governmental entities and others are coming together to address that. You saw the slide of what has happened in Pittsburgh. Everybody remembers Pittsburgh is an amazing story. Right? I grew up in Appalachia. Pittsburgh was that shining light on the hill to us. You know, I grew up in a small community of about 500 people. I'm blessed for that experience because I lived in a community where everybody literally looked out for everyone. Didn't matter what was going on. Um, somebody's house caught on fire, everybody was coming because we lived far enough away from the uh, fire department that they weren't going to make it in time. So everybody came in. When folks' crops came in, if folks needed help, folks showed up. When people went hunting and fishing, they also made sure that the elders in our community were taken care of. And my community was multiracial. So everybody, you know, was doing what they could to, to look out for each other. I, I'd say, I remember that story. Um, and, and I wonder, you know, if we had the majority of our communities across our country that actually lived by that sort of mantra, worked out of that sort of paradigm, how different it would be. And I think about the stories of folks that my grandfather and others used to share with me um, with folks who would come down from Pittsburgh back when Pittsburgh was a city with major steel mills and a number of other pollution that was going on and, and the various conditions that men and others were dealing with from their exposures. And now 
that it is beginning to, of course, make a positive change um, and has embraced the fact that the old fossil fuel industry is not the economy that, that folks have to operate from and have brought in new possibilities and new ideas. And those can be examples across the state of Pennsylvania of 21st century economy opportunities. Why is that important, Mustafa? Well, not only do we have 100,000 people who are dying prematurely, and of course, a number of those folks are there in the state of Pennsylvania from that air pollution, we also know that we got 24 million folks in our country who are suffering from asthma, 7 million kids. And disproportionately, it is African-American and Latinx children who are the ones who are going to the emergency rooms and the ones who are losing their lives. But as we begin to make the transition to a new economy, we can begin to shrink those numbers. We also know that as we begin to transition and make sure that there is a just transition, we can also make sure that there is an incredible amount of new jobs that are in that space. We can improve health care. And it's interesting because, you know, I've been all across the state of Pennsylvania and West Virginia, Kentucky, um, and uh, Ohio. And when I go into certain communities, I begin to look at some of these national numbers and see how they're playing out in, in everyday people's lives. You know, we got 24, 25 million folks are living in physician deserts and medically underserved areas. And I think about folks who are being getting all kinds of exposures, exposures in, in certain parts of the state where they're dealing with, you know, um, the processes around the extraction of fossil fuels, our mines. I think about in our fracking fields um, and the dynamics that are going there, um, especially to lower wealth communities, uh, lower wealth white communities. You know, there's an interesting study. I'm sure many of you saw that. Uh, there in Pennsylvania, they looked at uh, 800 uh, of the fracking uh, sites and wells, and only two of those were not in lower wealth communities. And then I began to think about, well, you know, we've got all these different types of exposures that are going on. What's happening in relationship to uh, the access to medical services? And you'll find that, you know, especially in many of our rural areas, you know, hospitals are closed and, and clinics sometimes are uh, overrun or indefinitely underfunded. And with this new clean economy, we've got an opportunity to actually change that dynamic as well. So as we are eliminating uh, the impacts that are happening from pollution, we also can help to create more jobs, you know, through the opportunities that, that come from the medical side of the equation. And I also start to look at, as I travel around the country, and many of you know, I've worked in over 700 communities, um, some say it's getting closer to 1,000 now, both in our country and outside. Some of these other dynamics that go on is definitely food insecurity. And I know many folks who are watching today are engaged, you know, in, in the struggle around addressing that issue. And we've got 24 million people in our country who, um, before COVID-19, were dealing with living in these food insecure areas. And our farmers who are there in Pennsylvania. You know, how do we better help to support them in this moment and understanding these impacts that are coming and, and that are happening from the climate crisis um, and also in dealing with the pollution that is often associated with um, agricultural practices. We know what are some of the drivers, um, you know, both in our water pollution and, uh, and, and what's going on in relationship to the climate crisis. And we know one of them is around deforestation. Another one is around agricultural uh, practices. Another one is around the various air impacts that are going on. And of course, we know where are those communities where, um, you know, the majority of fossil fuel facilities are located in communities of color and lower wealth communities. And, and so as we begin to unpack, we begin to also see that there are sets of opportunities for us to change the dynamics that are currently going on. Let me just ask folks, and, and I, I, I can't see everyone, normally, you know, we would be together, but I want you to just think about this real quickly. How many folks this morning uh, have had a drink of water or a beverage? You know, just go ahead and raise your hand. There may be somebody in the room with you. And I just want you to think about that. You know, there are two things that, that I often share with folks. One is the importance of us being able to have a breath of clean air. So critically important, and it's unfortunate. We have so much work to do to make sure that, that dynamic changes there in Pennsylvania and across our country. And I know there are folks who are, who are working. 
uh, make that happen. The other one is, you know, is these are human rights, right? You can't live without air and you can't live without water. Now, our indigenous brothers and sisters are so incredibly right when they share with us that water is life. And we know the impacts that are going on in our country over the last decade. Again, I want you all to put this in reference, right? Or in context. We live in the wealthiest country in the world. But over the last decade, we've had 60 million people dealing with unsafe drinking water. 60 million people. In Pennsylvania is no different. You all know the impacts that are happening from all the various sectors that are there. And we have an opportunity to make change happen. You know, we can, we'll talk about natural infrastructure and man-made infrastructure here in one quick second, but we've got to also stop you know, these various forms of water pollution that are going on. When we take a look out, and I work with folks at NASA and some of the other folks who are in that space, and when you actually slow down and take a look at our planet um, from outside, it's, it's amazing. But then when you really understand how small the amount of safe, water is across our planet, it really puts it in perspective for you. And inside of that perspective is the fact that we have to stop continuing to abuse and damage that precious resource, which is a basic amenity. We know it comes in so many different forms and fashions. And one part of the state, it can be around certified animal feeding operations and what's going on. Another it is coming from, you know, the various factories and plants. And even though we have the laws in place, we know that the difference between compliance and enforcement, and I've worked in that space for a number of years and making sure that we are doing what we can to help companies, but at the same time, holding them accountable is critically important. We also know that there are impacts, you know, on, on the fracking side and some of the chemicals that are used in that process. We know that in other forms of mining, that there are impacts. I grew up with them uh, growing up in West Virginia. But we also know that there are folks who are on the job, uh, who are watching both on the community side and who are doing their own sets of water testing. And we need to make sure there are more resources for those organizations. We also know that, you know, there are folks uh, inside the states who are also doing what they can. We have to continue to strengthen both of those processes to make sure that real change happens. And We've got to better support community-based participatory research and traditional environmental knowledge um, and making sure that they have the resources that they need um, to, to be that on the ground presence, which is so critically important. And if we don't, then we know we're putting ourselves in a very precarious situation. And just let me call this out um, as I move to one other issue that I want to talk about today. For those of you who have not yet read the reports from the IPCC and the National Climate Assessment reports, you know, they're very clear with many of these impacts that are coming. And of course, when you really begin to understand how critically important water is, then you understand also why we have to be so diligent on both addressing these impacts that are happening inside of our most vulnerable communities where many of the drivers um, of the climate crisis are located. And folks have for decades been saying, please pay attention over here, where our lives are being impacted, our health is being impacted, our lives are being taken, and folks didn't pay attention for the longest time. And now we find out that many of the dynamics that were going on in our most vulnerable communities are also major drivers in what's going on in, in relationship to the climate crisis. And thinking critically, about shrinking water supplies and how we're gonna best protect those and hopefully begin to reverse that trend. So Mustafa, you've shared some of the impacts that are currently going on. Where is the bright spot? What's the North Star in the work that we're doing? Well, the North Star is one has always been there, that we need to honor the work that is happening from frontline leaders that we have to build authentic collaborative partnerships. Let me say that again for folks, because people will often say, well, we have partnerships with communities, we have partnerships with other stakeholders. 
There's a difference between an authentic collaborative partnership and a partnership. It's almost like, you know, if you have a healthy relationship, husband, wife, partner, partner, boyfriend, girlfriend, friend, friend, is there honesty in that? Is there transparency in that? Is there consistency in that relationship? That is a part of the North Star process that I often talk about. You have to build real relationships with communities. And that gets scary for some folks. And I'm gonna give y'all some real talk. And if you didn't want real talk, you shouldn't have invited me. You know, the real talk is also that you have to share power and you have to share resources. And that gets tricky for folks because we're raised in a society says to do everything you can to garner as much as you can. And that then makes you powerful. And then you get to make the decisions. We have to change that paradigm. That is an old 20th century paradigm. If it was a paradigm that was effective, we would not be facing the situations that we currently do. We would not have the problems with systemic racism that we do. We would not have the problems with the climate crisis that we do if we better understood that. Now, with that being said, that means that for everybody who's watching, my organization and all of our organizations, there are changes that are going to be necessary if we're going to be serious about environmental justice. That means, of course, when we take a look at our boards, we should look like America. When we take a look at our senior leadership, it should look like America. When we take a look at the priority setting that we're doing, those priorities should be linked up with what, uh, you know, folks from the front lines and others are asking for. And that is in our policy development, uh, in our programs and our activities. And let me share this with you also, because there are some simplistic things that we can do that take work and there are some complexities to it. I often share with folks and, you know, I was a part of, you know, 24 years of federal service, 22 years at EPA, two years on Capitol Hill. I've advised White Houses, all that kind of stuff. In this moment, we have to be doing environmental justice analysis for all the things that we just talked about. Our programs, policies, budgeting decisions should all run through an environmental justice analysis. I was blessed to see that folks are also having uh, conversations and beginning some serious work on cumulative impacts because we know that that is a dynamic inside of our most vulnerable communities where they're dealing with a number of different uh, types of issues that have to be a part um, of the analyses that are necessary. In this moment, this transformational moment, we finally have a chance to do all of the things that I know so many of you have been wanting to do. There are finally the resources to be able to make sure that that part of the equation isn't um, as, um, that it doesn't slow down the process as much as it has before. All of you know, whether inside of your organizations or those who are working in various levels of government, it always comes down to resources. And many times you wanna do the right things, but you just haven't had the resources. So now, for the first time ever, you've got, uh, two trillion dollars that's going to be a part of the climate resources. You have around three trillion, even though the president said 2.25 trillion around the infrastructure and jobs uh, set of packages that are going on. And you've got the CCC program, and that's critically important because that CCC program, the 21st century CCC program that has a number of dollars attached to it as well, actually can help us around natural infrastructure and a lot of the work that we need to do there you know, around rebuilding up, um, you know, our coastlines and making sure that we're also working on our rivers um, and all the various things that are going to need to be done around some of the tree planting and a number of other things that are part of that. And inside of those dollars that I just referenced, you also have an opportunity to address many of the needs that have been in the housing space and around energy efficiency and advanced manufacturing and a number of other things that help us to be able to move forward on the climate economy. And something that I hope the state of Pennsylvania will focus on as well is that it is great when we talk about wind and solar and thermal and tidal and a number of other things that are part of the climate economy and getting people uh, a job with a livable wage. But let's also support those folks who are entrepreneurs in this space and making sure that they can create their own businesses, which is critically important because that will allow folks to actually build wealth inside of their communities because they can hire locally 
and they can make sure that they are also playing a role in helping us to protect our planet and protect our communities. And not enough folks sometimes actually think about that. And these environmental justice hubs, as I close out, are so important, but they have to be funded. And if you fund the environmental justice hubs, let me just share with you what that can actually translate into. I want everybody to actually either, you can do it in this moment or after I get done, actually look at the Regenesis Project in Spartanburg, South Carolina. The reason I bring this project up, and I can list out a few others, and, and I'm more than willing to, to share with folks different things that you might want to get, look at and give some consideration to. The Regenesis Project um, started off with a small environmental justice grant of about $20,000, and they've now leveraged it in almost $300 million in changes. They've built 144 partners in that, and communities are at the center. It is their vision that is being implemented. And it looks like many of our communities across Pennsylvania and many other parts of our country, they were dealing with brownfields and Superfund sites. Y'all know what that is, those most toxic sites. They were dealing with lack of access to healthcare. Seniors had to travel about a half an hour by bus to be able to get to healthcare. They were dealing with um, serious housing issues. Now, Many of us who come from the country or you lived in the South, you'll know when I talk about shotgun housing. Y'all know what shotgun housing is. You open up the front door, you can see out the back door. Ain't a whole lot of efficiency, uh, energy efficiency going in. Although, you know, our elders understood how to use newspapers and a number of other things. People are living in shotgun housing. They're paying three to $400 a month for their electricity costs. Imagine that. If you're someone who's, you know, trying to keep food on the table, and, and, you know, be able to pay the rent or the mortgage, you know, three to $400 a month can be significant for some folks. You know, they were dealing with food insecurity issues where there wasn't, you know, a supermarket that was close by. They were dealing with um, civic process issues, getting people to vote and a number of other things. Fast forward real quickly. You guys can read for yourself how transformative this is. We got the black, uh, brownfields and Superfund sites cleaned up. We got uh, 500 new green homes in, and those new green homes actually lowered people's electricity costs from $400 a month down to $67 a month. And those brownfields and Superfund sites that I referenced that were cleaned up, they're now putting a 35 acre solar farm on there that will zero out people's electricity costs. They also had worker training programs. So when all this rebuilding was happening in the community, it was the community who was actually playing a significant role in the rebuilding. They got five healthcare units and one mobile unit that goes out to peoples and schools uh, who don't have access to transportation. And they created jobs of local folks working in those entities. They got a new supermarket in. And then uh, next to the supermarket, people began to build other businesses around that. So they were building more economic power. They got folks to understand that you got to vote. I share this with all of our folks who care about environmental issues and climate issues, you, you got to vote. And because they got folks understanding the power that existed inside of their vote, they got folks on the city council, on the county commission, and eventually into the state house, where the first solar bill was passed in the South because of having folks like Harold Mitchell and others a part of that process. And there were a number of other incredible things happen. They got a, a new senior and recreational center so they could hold on to culture so that there was a place where young people and elders could come together. I share this with you because the environmental justice hubs can be a transformational, the climate hubs, whatever set of words that you have with those hubs, they can be transformational and they should be transformational in this moment because there are other dollars and resources that are a part, um, you know, that are coming from the federal government that will come to the states and the states will have to make decisions about how they're going to use those. So this is our moment to be able to say whether we're in the central part of Pennsylvania or the northern part or in western PA where I grew up um, or over in Philly, we have an opportunity to meet the needs of communities, to bring people together and to actually build um, a new set of opportunities. And I hope that the hubs will play 
an amazing uh, role in that space. But that means that we've got to be able to make sure that we're honoring the voice of communities. That's got to mean that in the states that we're building the competencies around this that's necessary. Those foundations, uh, other organizations have to build the competencies as well. And frontline communities can play a role in that. They are experts in many of the issues that are going on. Um, so we've got a chance for real change. I should have warned y'all that I was raised in a family of ministers so they can go for a while and, um, uh, and I'm the quiet one in the family. So I will leave you with this as we transition. Dr. King shared that we come to these shores in different ships, but we're all in the same boat now. I want y'all to think about that. In relationship to so many issues, we're in the same boat. You know, in relationship to the pandemic, we're in the same boat, even though we have disproportionate impacts that happen to communities of color. We're in the same boat, actually, in relationship to systemic racism, because the impacts of it, yes, you know, Black and Brown and Asian and Pacific Islander folks and Indigenous folks uh, are the recipients many times of the negative parts, but it ripples throughout our economy and it ripples throughout our country. And we're in the same boat in relationship to the climate crisis and these environmental impacts that are going on. But we have an opportunity to also stay focused on that North Star and make real change happen. We have power. Unless we give it away, we have to utilize it in a positive way. I am Dr. Mustafa Santiago Ali. Thank you all for a few moments of your time. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Ali. That was uh, that was fantastic. That's uh, I think why we why we asked you to come here and be a part of our program. Really wonderful. Um, mm -hmm. A round of applause for everybody at home. Yeah. <clears throat> And uh, so we're going to do some Q and A here for a bit with you, um, Rafika. You want to you want to take the 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 first the first uh, question here? Well, I just want to make some comments, and I mean, he covered all the questions. I think <laughs> um, really deal, dealt with the elephant in the room, and that's one thing I definitely want to say that we have to deal with that elephant in the room, which is racism. Um, racism is the cause of a lot of our ills in this country. People have a hard under uh, have a hard time to understand that this country was built on racism. If you really take time and do some reading and research, um, we was in a time where we had you know people that was enslaved and and doing things, which is also falls under environmental injustice, and we just don't look at it that way. Um, there was something that we had talked about in our our meeting last night, briefly be uh, planning for this morning was about voting, and I had mentioned that. Um, People need to vote. This is what this country is built on that basis. Um, some people don't want to do that. It plays a very important part in our daily lives, in our water, in our, our land, and in, 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 in our air, everything that we're doing, that voting piece plays a part in that. And Dr. Ali also talked about something that's very important to myself. I don't ask people to help. I just, if I see a situation or a problem, always remember the solutions and the problem. And we need to take it upon ourselves to, to uh, mitigate some of these things. Dealing with positive partnerships. When he said that that is so critical. People just want to um, say that they're connected to someone, but are they really connected and are they really doing the work? Partnerships I value very, very um, dearly um, because they work. If they're if they're done correctly, if people are at the table, and again, if you are not invited to a table, there's times I've <laughs> busted into meetings with my own chair and sat down and said what we need to do in our community. We can do these things. I just want everybody on this platform today, and, and Dr. Ali, you, I don't have any questions. I'm looking in the chat, and everybody's like, well said, thank you, thank you, thank you. You hit on a lot of points that needs to be hit on. But until we all deal with that elephant in the room with racism, I don't care where you are, we're still going to have these same issues over and over and over again. And it's okay to say that uh, a lot of this was for white men because it was. Those are facts. And we have to deal with facts in our country. And some people have a really hard time with that. We have to deal with reality when we're talking about environmental justice. We have to deal with what we see in front of our eyes. So there was not, um, I mean, I don't have any questions. I took down some notes just for, just for me to have. Um, 
but he he hit on a lot of things. And I think that after today, I just hope people just take some time and do some serious research, um, really engage in their local communities. And one thing I wanted to say before um, I turn it back over to you, Peter, is that get to know who people are. Some of us that act like we're just, and I see that right here in Harrisburg, we're afraid to engage with each other. We're afraid to speak to each other. We don't have no problem with tearing each other down. We don't have no problem with talking negative about each other. We don't have no problem with starting rumors and feeding off of those rumors, which can lead into something else. It is very critical to know who your neighbor is, what activities is going on in your community, um, and come together and, and make some changes. For us here in Harrisburg, we need to clean up. I'm born and raised here. I've never seen my city so filthy and dirty. We're going to start a campaign to teach people how to actually sweep their front porches and sweep their sidewalks and how to properly bag trash. It sounds so minute, but it's something that's very critical and very serious. Because again, we have to be responsible for ourselves. So that's definitely an action step you're gonna hear me say over and over today. We have to be responsible. We have to take the first step and then we can reach out to others to, um, to bring all this full circle. I appreciate everything that you said, Dr. Ali today. Um, I will be following you from this point on in the future and, and learning more about your work and the things that you're doing, you know, not just here, but you know, across our planet. And it's very, very important that we all, um, you know, get connected. Please connect with us on, on the EJ um, forums, on our meetings. They're all public. I haven't sat at any table where community has not been able to come and engage. But it's up to you to make that step. It's up to you to make that click on your phone or on your computer. It's up to you to be able to walk in, into communities and activities and we're able to go in person. But from where I sit and what I see, Everybody can be involved. Everybody can be engaged. But again, as you're saying, I'm putting it back on you. Dr. Ali, would you care to respond there? Well, first of all, thank you for allowing me to share space. I mean, you know, starting with the beginning of the conversation, you know, folks in our country get so afraid to talk about race. They get so afraid to talk about racism because folks feel that someone is going to call you a racist. You know, um, we know the history. We know the impacts that have happened. Question is, what do you do in this moment to both um, address what you can from the past and how do you build moving forward, right? My father used to say, don't tell me that you love me. Show me that you love me. If we truly love each other, then we will do things differently. And that means that we have to be intentional about doing things differently in the systems that we build and the systems that exist. Um, and, and that means that, you know, we've got to unpack some of that. There are those times when we're going to have to, uh, we most definitely have to bring new folks into those systems. Um, and there are some folks who no, need to no longer be in 21st century systems. If they cannot evolve, right? The beauty of being a human is that evolution <laughs> is a part of, uh, of our history in so many different forms or fashion. So I'm never one for discarding people. I believe people will discard themselves uh, if they refuse to evolve and change. Um, so, you know, we have to go down that hard road. Now, you hope that folks will do things just because it's altruistic, because it's the right thing to do. There are others who are driven by resources and by money. You know, I'm working diligently. I'm, I'm, I, I try to be as transparent with folks as I can. So with all the things that are, are going on in Washington and going on on Capitol Hill, and I'm blessed to be engaged with uh, a number of those things, I'm trying to make sure that criteria is built into all of these resources that are flowing, and many others are as well. I want to make it sound like it's just me, you know, to hold people accountable. So one, to uplift, right? The work that needs to happen in the states, because reality is folks <laughs> on Capitol Hill and folks in Washington, D.C., you know, they operate sometimes inside of a bubble. Some people are doing the best they can. Others, I'm not sure <laughs> where they grew up. But uh, the reality is that the work happens in the states and on local government. And that means for me 
that's where we really got to make sure there's strong criteria built um, because we all know that folks have been doing the work with shoestrings, both in the states and uh, in grassroots organizations. And now there is going to be a huge amount of money that's going to flow. And if we are not intentional and build the mechanisms inside of that to make sure it actually makes it to the communities that need it the most, it will flow right on by. So that means that the states have to build their capacity. They've got to get their competencies right. And we've got to help to build the capacity for folks to even be able to compete for many of these dollars, right? Even if they're grants, um, if they're contracts and subcontracting opportunities. And I have been traveling virtually <laughs> around the country, sharing that message of you got to make sure that we're getting people prepared for what's coming. Um, or, you know, in this moment, there's so much hope, right? And, and, and that's a good thing. But with hope comes expectations. And if we're not able to land those expectations with real resources and real change, then people will unfortunately begin to once again, not believe in the system, even, mm -hmm. in, even in a system that is growing and evolving. So I, I just wanted to share that with folks. That's great. Thank you. Thank you so much uh, for sharing that. We have questions that have come in through the chat box. And so I'm going to try to put some of those together. And, and I think I'll start around the notion of policy and politics. So there's, um, there's a lot of distrust of government agencies. Sometimes it's your local government. Sometimes it's the Department of Environmental Protection because they've permitted something that, you know, the community says, how in the could that possibly have been permitted? Or we just got a comment in the chat here about, you know, um, you know, that our Department of Transportation is sometimes incredibly unresponsive. Mm -hmm. So you have like agency unresponsiveness that can be a challenge, but then you have mm -hmm. legislative intransigence as well. And so I used to be a township supervisor. I was the chair of my board of supervisors. And we, along with almost, you know, with hundreds of municipalities in Pennsylvania, passed a resolution calling for an end to partisan gerrymandering. And so you talked about enfranchisement earlier. So I'm wondering if you can address these, these two things, you have agencies that can be unresponsive and citizens want to know, well, how are we supposed to overcome that? Mm -hmm. And then you have, you know, like a legislature that's gerrymandered and just won't do what the people want them to do. So what, what's your advice? Well, the gerrymandering thing is always difficult, right? Because that goes back to power and tied into resources and folks don't want to let that go, even though when they see, you know, uh, numbers changing and all those different types of things. That's the hard work that many of us do. So I do a lot of work also in the voting space and on the civic process and, and, and slowly dismantling that. You know, we did a lot of work down in Georgia uh, to begin that. And we saw the repercussions, uh, you know, of folks coming out and voting. Um, and, and people trying to change laws and do all this other type of stuff. Um, so we just continue to stay in that process and, and help people to really build a stronger foundation on the local level um, and on the county level and getting the right folks in there who care about what's going on. And then we start to build up from there and it takes a while and it can be frustrating because we want change to be light switch and it doesn't work that way. So we got to get in there and we got to do it. And we got to continue to educate brothers and sisters. You know, there are always the folks who are on the extremes and it's not really extremes. That's just where they're operating from and, and, and working with those folks that are there in the middle to be able, you would be amazed that project that I shared with you, there was very confrontational relationships in the beginning in that space. And over time, people working with each other and focusing on their commonalities actually began to build real partnerships and real actual friendships and relationships with business and industry and the community that was there. And I, I went kind of fast, so I didn't talk a lot about that part because I, I knew I was talking too long. Um, but we've got to also work with folks who are there in the middle to help them to understand this new set of opportunities. Politicians want to be able, in many instances, um, in most realities, <laughs> want to be able to point to some positive things that happen so that folks will be like, well, I need to, you know, vote them in again. Now we know that that's not always the model that folks are operating in right in this moment, but, you know, we still have a lot of work to do with folks 
who just don't know and who are persuaded to move uh, sometimes in a not uh, so helpful direction because they just didn't know. Um, now, that's not everybody. You know, I, I'm an optimist, but by no means do I live in, in, in an alternate reality. So that that's one part um, of what's going on. And I can share some information with folks who can contact me afterwards and we can go deeper uh, into some of that with some of the tools and information that I have. Um, I'm trying to remember the other part of the conversation was, I think, around the institutions themselves. Was that correct? Yeah, agency just sort of inertia or ignoring yeah. folks. Yeah, so that is a dynamic that has to change, right? And, and it's going to change um, because, one, you got to make sure that the agencies have the capacity. You know, I've worked with and in, you know, different uh, governmental agencies sometimes. It is because they, uh, one, there hasn't been the right priority setting, two, because they don't have the, the capacity and resources to be able to meet the full needs, three, because there's not transparency in the process, and four, because uh, the, I'll just use uh, uh, I, um, uh, a state that, you know, I'm not going to call out a, a specific state, but in their transportation work, they don't have a uh, a, a environmental justice advisory committee that's a part of the work that's just happening inside of that transportation part that then feeds into the environmental justice advisory board as an example they don't have that body inside of the housing shop because if they did then there would be a vehicle an additional vehicle for communities to have voice in that process and other stakeholders that that are needed so we've got to build these other components that help to build accountability, that help to uh, translate many of the items that are going on. And then it comes to the senior leadership. If they're serious about these issues, then they're going to hold people accountable. And here's what you do. So when I was in the federal government, um, right before the year before I left, we were beginning a process to actually build environmental justice into folks' performance um, evaluations. You'd be surprised how quickly, if you do that, it will change how quickly folks get back to folks and, and, and how much more attention people will pay. So I would ask the question, in the state of Pennsylvania, for the folks who are there, who are working in the state government, is environmental justice now one of the criteria that you are evaluated on in your mid-year and your yearly evaluation? If it is not, it is a missing component that folks will have to, you know, begin to uh, frame out how they want to do that. Um, and how, why is that helpful? Well, you're going to have a whole bunch of resources that are going to be uh, that are going to come. So hopefully that will deal with some of the capacity. You're going to have to hire some more folks. Um, and of course, you're going to want to be able to hold people accountable um, for the job that we're getting paid to do. Um, so that is another way of beginning to sort of change that dynamic um, that you raised, Peter. That's great. Thank you. So you, we, we still have a few minutes left here for, for Q&A before we do our transition. You talked about the, you raised the Civilian Climate Corps earlier, the CCC, and I put in the chat box a, you know, a link to some information about that. And, you know, one of the things that, that, you know, obviously the country today has come to flashpoints around racism. You know, since uh, I mean, this this week and last are the trial um, of officer, former officer Derek Chauvin, who uh, murdered George Floyd in plain sight. Um, obviously, you know, uh, traumatizing the people, and they're having to relive that. Uh, this this week and last, the witnesses. Um, we also had an insurrection where people were flying Confederate flags, where, you know, people were wearing, you know, sweatshirts that with the most outlandish things that I'm not going to repeat here because I don't want to grease them with, you know, with having that garbage replicated. And the, so we have this absolutely polarizing violence in the country and also slow violence. It seems to me that one of the things that the Civilian Climate Corps could do is just change the subject because it gets folks to work who may not otherwise work together. 
The most dangerous things in the world are men between the ages of like 16 and 30 who are unemployed, right? We know that. We know that in the United States. We know that in Pakistan, you know? And so it seems to me that the CCC could just get people working together on things that matter to them and aren't this like, you know, guy who's orange, you know, you know, going bananas every day on a on a social media platform. I, yeah. I might get in trouble for saying that, but you know, thoughts on that. Yeah, well, you know, um, I, I promise I wouldn't get it too deep into politics, so I'll leave that alone. I'll let you uh I'll let you deal with that, but I can definitely unpack that one. <laughs> um so let me let me just say that I agree. Let me give an example. You know, um, I was an athlete most of my life. I'm getting a little bit older now, so I can't run and jump and, and hit like I once did. But sports is a great example of how it has over the years been able to bring folks together, right? You know, um, actually help to bridge the racial divide, even though it took a lot of hard work uh, for a number, you know, for, for a while. And what we find is that the CCC program, we're, once again, let's have real talk. When the first time the CCC program out came out, in the time that it was designed, you know, racism was infused into the CCC program and sexism. So um, the African Americans who were hired in the CCC program at that time were given the dirtiest and most dangerous jobs to do. Women were excluded from the CCC program for 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 a long part of it, and then toward the latter part, um, they were then uh, a part of it. So we've understood that. I've been doing work around a set of roundtable discussions and town halls, and we've had about 10,000 people participate in actually talking about the 21st century CCC program um, with a number of leaders of color about, one, what are the sets of opportunities? Two, how can it be transformative, both on the educational side, uh, on the new skill set side, and being able to bring people together on sets of projects that people can feel and touch. Um, and then when you really want to get advanced in it, then you begin to ask the question about who are the businesses that will be a part of this? Um, and what are the new sets of business opportunities for all of the various tools and aspects that will be a part of that? So Peter, I agree with you. It is an opportunity to bring folks together to get some work done in spaces and places that have been overlooked for a number of different reasons. Um, and at the same time, help us um, in relationship to the climate crisis. So we know right now, you know, that we still have millions and millions and millions of people who are unemployed. COVID, of course, exacerbated that. We've been getting to bring some of those numbers down now, but we still got a whole bunch of lower wealth white uh, youth We've got black and brown youth. We've got others um, who, you know, when we look at our employment numbers, you know, it's where the disparities exist. This is an opportunity to get folks back. And to also, hopefully, and there are uh, four, I believe, different pieces of legislation on Capitol Hill right now um, around the CCC program. We can also use it as an opportunity um, to also make sure that folks either finish education or get some opportunities to continue education which is really important also. Um, so I'm a big proponent um, of our community colleges and our other types of training programs that are out there for folks who are not interested in that track, along with our historically black colleges and universities, our Hispanic serving institutions and our tribal colleges. So the CCC program, like many of these other initiatives, gives us a chance um, to, to do good and do well at the same time. So I wanna address a comment because I think it's a really worthwhile comment that comes from Ms. Mayfield, who said that unemployed, calling me out for saying that unemployed men were the uh, uh, most dangerous force on the planet. And I, I, I will walk that back and and I will say that really well organized, highly educated, well funded polluters um, are uh, potentially or no more dangerous because they damage people's lives every day. So. Um, I could say more about that, I'm sure, but I just want to honor that comment because I think it uh, it needs it. Um, there's a question here also about um, air sheds. Mm -hmm. 
and the concept of air sheds. Can, can you say something about that? Well, I mean, understanding air sheds is so critically important because we all know that air pollution moves. Um, we also understand that, you know, folks in many instances who are closest to those polluting facilities, um, you know, receive, you know, uh, they sometimes receive double and triple whammies. You know, they get the hit um, from those exposures. Of course, we know stuff moves down um, and plays a role in the warming up of our oceans and our planet. Then they get the swing back from these, uh, these just uh, amazing climate crises that we find ourselves in. Um, uh, you know, everything from these extreme heat events to these um, amazing sets of floods that are going on and, and a number of the other things. And I share this with folks also in relationship to the air sheds. You know, we've needed additional dollars um, to actually be able to make sure the right types of uh, additional monitoring was going on in that space and having a better understanding of, of some of the dynamics that are going on. So I call that part out in this conversation because if you go back to the stimulus dollars that recently came out, that $1.9 trillion, there was $100 million inside of there for uh, environmental justice work. $50 million is going to the additional monitors and monitoring uh, and processes for vulnerable communities. Another 50 million was dedicated to other sets of environmental justice work. So in relationship to our air sheds and the impacts that are happening, you know, across regions and sometimes in smaller um, sets of area bases, um, we've got some additional help um, that we can utilize in that to one better understand the impacts that are going on Two, to begin to think critically uh, about the mitigation sets of tools and efforts that we can put in place. And three, which is critically important is to also to begin to make sure that we're honoring that research um, that frontline organizations are doing, whether on themselves or in connection with a academic institution or another body. So, so what metrics, you know, should we be using, you know, like at the, at the local level, if we're supposed mm -hmm. to work, you know, if we're going to work with agencies or universities dealing with EJ, what would those metrics be? Well, I think it depends, you know, that's a tricky question. There are the basics, right? But we know that there are different sets of issues that are happening across the state that, you know, you would need to be able to bring in some other information that's in there. So I would encourage everyone um, to, to look at um, the environmental justice analyses that, you know, that the folks have put together at the Environmental Protection Agency. Now, of course, a part of that is the use of EJ screen um, um, and other states are now developing their own tools that give you a set of uh, basic metrics that folks are looking at um, and then walk you through sort of this analysis. Um, and, and then of course you add into that your own uh, sets of needs. You know, it could be around housing and transportation, education, uh, where dollars are going, which is really illuminating when if, if you actually spend the time, map out your state, look at where your grants are going, Look at where some of the other funding stream are, go are going and, and see how that lights up. Then you begin to overlay where housing uh, related sets of challenges are, you know, where your transportation routes are going. Uh, and I can go through all that stuff. Um, so when someone asks the question around metrics, I always point them back to folks who have put it together based upon conversations with all kinds of leaders across the country um, as a starting point. Dr. Great. Ali, I think we have one more question before we um, stop. Hold on just a second. Sorry about that. Um, I wanted to just to, to put out in, in the community today um, about entrepreneurship. Everybody's not going to school and college, et cetera, but people have excellent ideas. And um, a lot of that is what helped build this country, our, our ideas and our skills. What parts can a person play as far as being an entrepreneur, looking at all, because um, my, my, my mind is clicking. I'm an entrepreneur, I've been working for myself for about 40 years. So I, I see lots of opportunity, but somebody that might want to just do for themselves, but just don't know where to start. What would be um, a great place to start? Should we start with air quality or should they just go and look in their community and see where they could probably start? I mean, there, there are so many different opportunities there. So the first thing I always tell folks, you want to be an entrepreneur, surround yourself with other entrepreneurs. 
Um, and, and so they can, they will share with you the information that you won't learn in a course, right? So I think formal education is incredible, but it doesn't and oftentimes tell you about some of the challenges that are going on. The other part is to begin to understand what are the basics that you need to have in place if you're gonna own your own business, whether it is a sole proprietorship um, or if you're gonna have a number of people that are working for you. And you have to anchor that in whatever it is that you have a passion for, um, because that will help you, because <laughs> there will be a whole lot of tough days. Trust me, I've run my own businesses uh, where things don't necessarily go your way. So if air, air issues are your thing, water issues are your thing, um, you know, the rebuilding of communities is your thing. Um, you you, you got to have to really like what you're doing. The other thing is to then um, understand the opportunities that exist around the small business administration. And we're continuing to work with them to get them to be better. Um, and, and then understand that you need to get yourself certified or registered um, if you want to deal with state dollars um, or federal dollars. Um, and there are a couple of different processes there. But that's important because many of the dollars that I mentioned, even though some of those will be in a grant um, component based upon how states decide to do some things, there will be a lot of the other dollars that are going to come through contracting and subcontracting opportunities. And that means that you're going to have to make sure that you have, you know, your official structure in place. Um, and then continue to check in with whomever your mentors are um, uh, and, and you'll begin that process. So, um, again, it goes back to do what you love um, and eventually it will bear fruit. Thank you so much. I think we are at our time. I just want to give um, a, a little housekeeping tip that the hubs will start at 1250. Um, Dr. Ali, this has been awesome. Um, really appreciate all the uh, information that you've laid upon us today, all of the, the jewels you have given us today. And hopefully some people will reach out to you and uh, build some good partnerships and relationships, how we can move forward with this work. Um, Peter, do you have anything else to say before we hand it over to the next group? No, I just think this has been fantastic. And I really, I want to thank you again, <clears throat> uh, Mr. Ali. This has just been wonderful to be able to spend some time with you, to learn from you. Um, you know, I think everyone on the chat has been just incredibly engaged. They're, they're asking questions. And so we might have some follow-ups for you. You know, um, so if, if people wouldn't mind giving, a, you know, another round of applause, that's great. I really wish that we had a, that we could be safely together so that we could have the, the boom of the applause. That's just wonderful. Um, you know, I, I just think that at this, at this point, I, I really hope that, um, folks across the Commonwealth can, can really hear how much common cause we have that no matter, uh, whether, you know, we're living in a community near Philadelphia, whether you're in North Braddock, you know, where, you know, folks about half black, half white. You know, a, a a really poor community, but came together to fight both a fracking company and a and U.S. Steel at the same time, and did just incredible work. But they 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 had they got some resources, you know, and people from outside who believed in them. And so this conversation about resources is so essential. So if you are someone who is here today, from an organization with resources, whether you work at a university, whether you're in government, whether you're at a business. Um, and if you're doing well, we need you to be contributing to the solution and stop contributing to the problem. And, you know, Rafika and I were talking right before this, you know, saying that, you know, for many of us, and I don't wanna say everybody, but for many of us, you know, we are all a part of what uh, Wendell Berry calls a ubiquitous damn mess, right? And sometimes people at, you know, at the bottom are lazy and people at the top are just full of unbridled greed. And we're kind of, you know, awash in just a really difficult situation, but it's that engagement with each other for love of one another, for love of humanity, for your home, that really makes the difference. But to get it done and get what needs to be done, we need resources. And so if you're here from one of those organizations, 
find a way to give because that's what matters. These people give their time and they need your help, not you to make their lives worse. So on that, on that note of, you know, needing, needing to folks to show up, I want to hand it over to Shauna Barnhart from Bucknell University and the current uh, president of the Pennsylvania Environmental Resource Consortium and Heather Beatty, Dr. Heather Beatty from Dickinson College, who also serves on the state's Environmental Justice Advisory Board to move us into the next session, followed by um, a quick resource break from Covanta. Good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you for that introduction, Peter. Uh, my name is Shauna Barnhart. I'm a member of the planning committee, and I would like to give my appreciation to all of the speakers who have come before this morning, as well as um, all the lively uh, chat and resources that are being shared um, in the chat box. So my role here this morning is to do a roll call, roll call for the hubs and facilitators. Once you go into a hub, you'll learn more about the entities and the individuals who organized the hub session. So each hub um, had the flexibility of deciding how to approach the facilitation responsibility. So in some case, a, an external facilitator was invited. In some cases, it's members of the organizing um, entities or organizations. And so it will differ um, by hub, but you'll learn more about the organizing, um, the entities and individuals who organize that particular hub once you get into the session. And so what I'm going to do here is, is um, call out the facilitators uh, who will be um, guiding the conversations in each one of the hubs. The facilitator's role is essentially to keep the conversation moving with the goal of the group identifying next actionable steps by the end of the discussion. So with that, let's start. Um, we're going to start in the northeast uh, section. Of this is the hubs are done by um, the DEP regions, which are six regions. And so we'll start with the Northwest and we'll just move um, clockwise around the state. And if you are able facilitators, as I call it your name, wave or say hello in the chat box or something. And, um, and we'll get started here. So we have starting in the Northwest hub, we have Gary Horton, who is president and CEO of Urban Erie Community Development Corporation. And Sarah Bennett, the Penn Future um, uh, campaign manager. And then we have North Central um, will be Peter Buck, Penn State Sustainability Institute. Northeast, we have Melinda Crocus uh, from Marywood University, Kristen Cronin from Muhlenberg University, and Brianna Holland, Holland from Lehigh University. And then we'll move to the Southeast, where we have Nida Montez from Temple University. Stasia Montero from Neighborhood Advisory Committee Program Director of HASI CDC, and Russell Zerbo, Advocate at the Clean Air Council. From there, we'll move to South Central, um, where the facilitator is Christian Perry from Dickinson College Popol Shaw, Shaw, Shaw Center for Race and Ethnicity. And then concluding in the Southwest, where we have Matthew Mahalik, who is Executive Director of Breathe Project, and Jamil Bay, who is President and CEO of Urban Kind um, Institute. And so with that, I'm excited to see where the afternoon conversations go and I will turn it over to um, Heather Beatty to take us on the next step. Thanks so much, Shauna. And thank you for the wonderful um, engaging keynote speaker um, and also all the wonderful comments in the chat. So I would really um, like to just emphasize at this point um, that all of the organizing for this event um, has been around volunteer hours from folks that work other jobs or involved with other activism. So this event is not perfect as the organizers, um, who the co-chairs emphasized at the beginning, but it really represents an effort to try to get a range of folks together to talk about environmental justice issues. Um, so thank you to everyone for joining us this afternoon at 1250 for the community hub portion of the EJ and PA event. We hope these community meetings provide the opportunity for you to network with your neighbors, acknowledge environmental injustices, build solidarity, and gain consensus about specific calls to action. So each hub is gonna be able to determine what small, large, systemic, small scale, um, whatever kind of 
change is appropriate for you all to take. Um, that's really up to each of the individual hubs. Um, and just to emphasize again, those are not funded entities. Um, these are really just spaces if people want to uh, in the future, organize geographically. If in the future they want to organize around themes, it's totally up to folks to network as I see people are already doing in the chat, which I really appreciate it. Your trained facilitators in the hubs will guide you through a series of discussions to get to know your fellow community hub participants and to really understand the range of environmental injustice concerns, which we all know are quite uh, diverse and distinct um, throughout our Commonwealth. We hope to hear all ideas and voices as we're stronger with diversity and thought and actions. Um, at the end of the sessions, hubs will create an action plan if they so choose to tailored to their community needs um, and also their individual capacities where people want to be engaged uh, in terms of, again, as I said before, systemic change, smaller scale change. The latter portion of your community hub discussion centers on those specific calls to action. We want to encourage participants to think about both collective and indivi individual actions to address existing environmental injustices and to foresee and prevent future environmental injustices. As we know the historical injustices in Pennsylvania, unfortunately, endure and persist, um, but we also want to be able to foresee what might be coming uh, with future programs or other industries that might be coming up. So this is a great opportunity to think in terms of the history and the context of injustices, but also looking forward to how we can prevent further injustices in the future. Uh, again, your group might think about short-term, long-term solutions. Dr. Ali really got us thinking about systemic change. Uh, Rafika reiterated that really critical issues for all of us to grapple with and think through how do we uh, force policymakers, planners to really address some of these historical injustices. Uh, regardless of the approach you take, we encourage you to think about how we can change these systems that perpetuate injustices. Note takers at each of the hubs will capture broad ideas and there'll be a survey at the end to get additional individual thoughts. Um, we're also capturing the chat because I think this is really important to understand what issues people have concerns and differences about. We're all going to have different ideas, so that's really important. Your group may decide to convene again. Um, that's totally up to all of you to decide. Um, we are going to have a scheduled meeting in the fall of 2021 that we will invite folks uh, who want to join our organizing committee. We're happy to have um, different distinct voices. Uh, we're happy to think through if we want to end up having principles about funding sources for the future. Uh, most of the funding for this event is going to the tech support from the wonderful folks at Harrisburg University to support this. It's quite expensive uh, to run this kind of WebEx program. We really look forward to seeing you at these afternoon community hubs. Um, we really hope it's a time to reflect, gain knowledge, and build connections for positive change. Um, I'm going to now hand it over to our wonderful facilitator for the overall uh, symposium, Howard Tucker, who's going to walk you through next steps. Thank you. Howard, are you there? Good afternoon, everyone. There we go. Good afternoon, everyone, and uh, welcome to the afternoon session. Um, we tried to make this as interactive as possible, um, giving you opportunities to make choices on how you would like to spend your lunch break. So in a traditional conference, you'd have an opportunity to go see a panel or you would have the opportunity to sit at a table, meet people, um, give people an opportunity to, to share and to connect. And so we're going to do the same thing during our lunch break. You have an opportunity just to have lunch, go off, take a break, or you have the opportunity of going to um, the resource um, within the website and looking at the uh, videos that were there. We have many, many good videos that were shared by um, various individuals. And it's very educational, informational, and you could also follow up with some of the uh, information that you're seeing on the chats as well. Then also, too, there will be a networking um, open room uh, where you can continue to share in the chat 
um, as you meet others from around the state or within your local community that you never had a chance to meet as well. So that's an open forum and you can chat about uh, whatever you like and to share the information and resources um, that are available. I find this absolutely fascinating, um, the whole process and what we've seen today um, from the educational community and also to from affordable housing community. And I think it's so important for us to, to look across silos and to see what's going on in our various communities and how we can assist. And especially on the educational side, our children need to know and understand what's going on. And I really support the idea of STEM and STEAM as an opportunity to give them not only an education, but the opportunity for jobs and making um, their lives um, even better as part of their communities. So with that, All right, sorry to interrupt. This is Heather. If you could um, turn your volume up a little bit, I think folks can't hear you. And if you're, you can turn the video on. That's great. If you can't, don't worry. But um, folks, I think want it a little louder, please. Can you see me? And can you hear me? Yes. Perfect. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Good afternoon, everyone. I'll start over again. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Howard Tucker. I'm one of the coordinators for um, the event today. And I wanted to say to all of you, it's, it's great to see and hear all the excitement and information that's going across. And in a traditional conference um, during the lunch break, there would be opportunities for folks to meet, to gather, um, to see information, to look at presentation boards. And so we wanted to make the same opportunity on a virtual conference. So with that, you're able to, one, just take a break and have lunch. Um, two, you're able to go to the resource uh, within the website and to check out those resources. There are fascinating videos, information there that you can look at, or you can go into the networking session. It's an open forum. You can continue to chat, continue to share, continue to network across the state or within your local community. Um, and then afterwards, we're going into the hubs um, for the afternoon sessions and you get to go through those facilitated conversations. But I also wanted to say from someone that's coming from the education community and from the affordable housing community, I'm very fascinated by what I see today. And I'd like to see for us to reach out to the education and to the affordable housing committee because all these things impact our children, our seniors and our families. So I'm looking forward to seeing how this evolves and grows and get other sectors of our communities involved. So thank you for your participation and we look forward to seeing you this afternoon. All right, folks, thank you so much. We, um, we're going to have a quick resource break here right before we go out um, for lunch. And um, we look forward to seeing you in the hubs this afternoon. And thank you for all of your participation so far. We'll see you soon. Yes, Sarah.
Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. We'll see you after lunch or during lunch if you choose to join in the uh, in some of the lunchtime activities. Thank you very much. See you soon.